Once again, welcome everybody to this decodable webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about change stream processing with Apache Flink. And uh, our presenters are Sharon C, who is, um, I almost got it right there, uh, who is a founding engineer here at Decodable. Um, and welcoming Gunnar Morling to Decodable. So Gunnar is the former lead of the Debezium project and is going to be working on product here, but is also going to be spending a lot of time uh, talking about Debezium, talking about a lot of, a lot of topics of interest to, uh, to everybody in the streaming space. Um, so just a kind of housekeeping note, um, we're going to hold the Q&A until the end, but if you haven't done a Zoom webinar before, have a look, there's a button that says Q&A. If you want to put the questions in there, um, we'll answer them, maybe typing as we go through, and then if we want to kind of have a, um, have actually repeat the question at the end and talk about that, we will do that as well. Um, so with that, uh, thank you again, and I'm going to hand over to Gunnar and Sharon to get started. Cool. Sounds good. Um, John, thank you so much for facilitating. Welcome, everybody, to this webinar. I mean, for me, it's a very special event because I joined Decodable just two weeks ago, and it's my first ever official Decodable event. I'm a tiny bit nervous, but I'm sure it will be fun, and I have Sharon with me here. She knows her thing, so, you know, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to do this together with Sharon. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? And essentially, it's going to be roughly about three things. So I would like to talk a little bit to you about what is CDC, change data capture. So I will explain what it is, and in particular, why you would, why you would want to use it. Why do you care about CDC? Then, well, we are here for Apache Flink. So I would like to explain a little bit what you can do if you combine the powers of CDC and Apache Flink, stream processing and CDC together. So we will dive a little bit on some use cases. And then I will hand it over to Sharon, and she will do uh, a demo and show us some of those uh, things in Decodable in action. And I really look forward to that. Um, about us, I mean, John introduced us already. So as um, he mentioned, I used to be the lead of the BISM, so um, I know a little bit about um, CDC. But while I was working on it, I also felt I would like to learn more about using CDC in the context of stream processing. And this is why I joined Decodable, to have the opportunity to explore those data flows end to end. Um, Sharon, want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, so. Like John said, I'm the founding engineer of Decodable, um, and I spent the past five years, uh, you know, doing all sorts of things with uh, Flink, mostly building a data platform uh, using Flink. So um, it's super fun, uh, and there's a reason why I've used Flink in different cases and different companies. It works really well. Um, Another thing is I started learning about the DZM and change data capture earlier this year, and I had a really fun journey. So I really look forward to use this opportunity to share the fun with everyone. Back cool. to you. Gina. Awesome. <laughs> and I take it you will take all the hard flink questions today, right? <laughs> sure. All right. So let's just briefly explain why we are here. So why do we do this talk about uh, Flink? Um, so as I mentioned, we uh, work as software engineers at Decodable, and Decodable is a real-time stream processing platform which is based on Apache Flink. And you will see it later in action. Um, Sharon will show it to you. So the primary interface is SQL, so you define your flows in SQL. There's integrations with all kinds of connectors, like Debezium, but also all kinds of other connectors. Um, and this is, well, the motivation for us to talk about Flink stream processing and those kinds of things. All right, so let's dive a little bit into what is CDC change data capture. And generally speaking, the idea is uh, pretty simple. So it is about extracting data from your database. So let's say you have a relational database or something like MongoDB, whatever it is. All those databases work in the way that they have what's called the transaction log. So if you write to the database, what it will do is it will append events to this transaction log. So this transaction log, that's the source of truth. And now, Whenever uh, changes come in, well, those writes will go to the transaction log. So all the inserts, updates, deletes, they will be appended there. And then, of course, also the actual table files will be um, updated. So if you want to run a query, you can then go and use SQL to query your tables. But that's actually kind of a view already from the transaction log. 
And now the interesting thing is very often we would like to react to changes in our database. So if a new customer gets created, we would like to react to that event, maybe propagate it elsewhere. Or maybe if a purchase order gets updated, something gets deleted, we would like to react and process those events. And well, with the transaction log being the source of truth, the idea is quite obvious. Hey, if we can tap into that transaction log and we can um, essentially capture changes as they are appended to the log, this will allow us to do those kinds of things. So that's in a nutshell what CDC is about capturing changes out of an append only transaction log. And now you might wonder, maybe you have uh, implemented or seen other CDC approaches in the past, something like a query-based uh, CDC approach where you go to your database or to your tables, and then you poll in intervals, maybe every minute or something like that, you, uh, you poll for change data. And that's certainly also a uh, valid approach, but with the log-based CDC, I mean, there's quite a few advantages. I won't touch on too many of them, but A, it's definitely low latency. So you can react to changes with a very low latency, like within seconds or below a second even. Um, you will never miss an event. You will be able to capture deletes. So there's quite a few advantages want to just do this log-based approach. There are several implementations out there. Well, I, having worked on Debezium, that's the one I'm familiar with, and that's we are uh, what we are going to talk about. So that's what CDC is. Um, now the question is, why would you want to do this? And now this could be an entire talk, so I could talk for 30 minutes just about this little tweet about CDC use cases. But to give you an idea why you would be interested in using CDC, um, you could think about use cases like re replication, just taking your data from one database to another. So maybe you have like an Oracle database or something commercially licensed in production and you would like to have a view of the data in an open source database in a um, testing environment, maybe Postgres. So you could use CDC to capture changes in your production environment and then stream them over to this um, other database. Or maybe you would want to put your data into a data warehouse, something like Snowflake or Apache Pino, analytics databases, through it, all those kind of things. Um, well, you would like to keep those systems very closely in sync with your production database, right? Um, you don't want to update this only after hours or maybe days. You would like to have the data in your data warehouse really to be in sync. It should be, it should represent the reality in your operational database. And with log-based CDC, you can set up those low latency data integration flows. Or you would like to put data into a search index. And actually, that's what we will see in the demo today. So you will want to take your data from your relational database into Elasticsearch or OpenSearch, just because it provides much more powerful search capabilities. Um, so that's replication in the widest sense, I would say. But then there's many other interesting use cases. So maybe you work on an event-driven architecture where you have multiple microservices and they need to exchange data. They need to keep different views of the data of each other. Well, CDC allows you to do that and you could implement all kinds of patterns, which gives you abstractions. So you don't expose your internal models. Maybe you have heard about the outbox pattern. So you could use CDC for those kinds of things, or maybe for extracting data from a monolith and putting it into microservices. Audit logs, um, that's a very interesting one. I hope I will have a blog about it out in a bit. You could use CDC for creating audit logs and enriching them with metadata. So all kinds of things. Um, but I hope I could make the case uh, for why it's interesting. By the way, also, of course, um, um, streaming queries, right? Which is where Apache Flink comes in. Too. So we would like to have queries which are continuously updated. And of course, the source for those queries, that's the data as it changes in our operational database. So tons of use cases. Now, just briefly, how do those events look like? Um, and this is how they would like uh, would look like in Decodable. So essentially, it's keyed events. So if you are using Kafka or Pulsar, this will be familiar with you. So the key of those events, it's the primary key of your records. So maybe the customer ID or the purchase order ID. Um, the reason being for that is you want to keep the order for the events which pertain to one record or to one entity, if you will. So all the events which pertain to the same customer, to the same purchase uh, order, they should be uh, streamed to the consumers in order. And this is what we ensure by using the primary ID as our message key. And the value, well, that's the uh, that's the actual payload of our events. Um, there's, um, and if you have used Debezium, it will look familiar to you because it's kind of the Debezium format here. So there is some sort of metadata. What kind of event is this? Is this an update? Is it a delete? And so on. And then the old state of a row and the new state of a row. Um, so the schema of those before and after parts, this resembles the schema of the tables you're capturing. And again, you will see this in the demo in more detail later on. 
All right, so that's CDC in a nutshell. And now, um, well, I hope I could make the case it's, it's why it's a very powerful concept and it's certainly what I sense from the community. But then of course, well, you want to go and consume this data. I mean, just capturing it and maybe putting it into Kafka or putting it into whatever streaming platform you have. That's, you don't do this for its own sake, right? You would like to take this data and you would want to propagate it maybe to another database, to a data warehouse, to a search index, to a cache. So you need to think about how to integrate all those kinds of things. So that's a question you might ask yourself, how, go, how do I go about doing this? Then there's the question of the actual transport itself. So should I put Kafka in the middle? So I have my producers and consumers decoupled. If so, how do I operate this? Um, and do I use Kafka or Pulsar or Kinesis or whatever? So lots of uh, details and questions to be decided on there. And lastly, well, um, just taking data verbatim as is from A to B, that's not so exciting. Maybe you would like to process the data. You would like to filter it. You would like to modify it, maybe route it based on the payload. You would like to stream it to join your data. So you would, you would like to modify and, and process your data. And the question is, how do you do it? And well, that's where Apache Flink, of course, comes into the picture. And now, um, well, I'm not a Flink expert. I'm just learning about it yet, but I'm very excited about the capabilities. And what I hope I can explain a little bit is some applications of stream processing and Apache Flink in the context of CDC. I assume you have heard about Flink before. For those who haven't heard it, it's essentially a platform for real-time um, stream processing. So you can work on unbounded or bounded data streams like a, a stream with um, CDC data, and you can do all kinds of um, operations on it, like merging, joining, aggregating, grouping, um, filtering, projecting, and so on. So like all the relation operators you would know from a database, you could apply them to streams of data using Apache Flink. And of course it's well scalable, so you can scale it out to many compute nodes and it's, well, hopefully anyways, it's very um, performant and efficient. So that's Apache Flink. <clears throat> now what could we do with uh, Flink in the context of CDC? And in the most simplest case, we would just use it to take data from A to B. And in this case, you would use the Flink CDC connector. So that's a, a ready-made component provided by the team over at Viverica. So they essentially take the Bezium and a few other CDC sources and make them available as, as native Flink sources. So if you have been using the Bezium before, well, usually you will use it with Kafka Connect and have it stream your data into Kafka with Flink CDC. It would be a native Flink source, which just runs within Flink Link and you don't necessarily have to put it through Kafka or similar. And then, well, there's of course, again, this ecosystem of sync connectors. So you could use something like the JBC sync connector to take this data from the CDC stream and just propagate it into another database. Most of the times you would like to do something with this, with this data. So maybe you would just like to stream a subset of your data. Maybe there's some stale data or something which is logically deleted. So you're not interested in propagating it. So you would like to filter this out. Or maybe you would like to modify representations of your data. Typically date formats, that's the classic, like everybody wants to modify their date formats. So this is something you can do with, uh, with Flink, uh, stream processing element by element, you could modify those records. You could encrypt your data, you could, um, update the schema. Maybe if you use this in an event-driven architecture where you use it for going from an old database over to a new database, you would like to clean up the schema. Um, you know, don't expose all, all the quirks of the old model. So this is definitely a very interesting use case for stream processing. Then um, if you are familiar with all the enterprise, um, enterprise integration patterns from Gregory Hope, you will know about things like uh, content-based routing. So maybe you have a stream of order data coming in, purchase orders on one uh, from, from one particular CDC connector. And now based on the kind of purchase order, if it's a B2B order or B2C order or whatever, you would like to stream it to different databases because you have this uh, separate databases for those different applications. So you could route elements based on their contents. And well, you could of course also stream to many different kinds of things. So Flink, a little bit like Kafka Connect has a very rich ecosystem of connectors. There is pretty much something for everything for S3, Snowflake, uh, Apache Pino. I just put a few examples here. So really you can take your data and put it essentially to all kinds of data systems which you could um, think of. And we will see a few later on in, in, in the demo. What else is there? I mean, um, you could uh, use Flink and stream processing for enriching your change events. So there's a few interesting use cases. Maybe you have a stream again of purchase order 
uh, of purchase orders. And now you would like to enrich those events with customer data, which happens to be in another data source. So you won't be able to get this from the same database. Maybe it's another database or REST API, which you would like to use to access this customer data. And what you could do is you could essentially enrich all those purchase order change events with the customer data. So it's like a more complete event and send this perhaps over to a Kafka, uh, Kafka topic there. Just to, to keep in mind, if you do this, if you do those uh, remote calls for each of those elements in your streams, this could be a costly operation, right? Depending on what's the latency and so on. So definitely just as a tip, use asynchronous uh, non-blocking um, IO for that. So that those um, remote calls are not blocking your pipelines. And I put a link to the Flink docs there. Um, we will share the slides later on so you could read up on those details. Um, and lastly, what I wanted to mention in terms of CDC use cases on Flink is why you could join your data. So maybe you have something like an IoT scenario where there's data coming from, I don't know, temperature sensors out there, or here in Hamburg, for instance, we have a network of bicycle sensors. So they count in different parts of the city how many cyclists come by there. And that's like an MQTT stream could be converted to Kafka. It comes in here into Flink, and maybe you would like to enrich such an IoT stream with a reference data coming from a database. And you could use Flink for joining those events, um, combining them, and then put them maybe into um, Apache Pino. So you could do like a, ge like a nice um, um, geo visualization. Um, your idea really is the limit there. And again, um, this leads us to a few questions. So yes, uh, Flink is very powerful and we can do all kinds of things, but what does it mean for me? Does it mean I need to program those transformations and operators and, and, and um, jobs in, in Java, maybe another programming language? So do I need to be a programmer in order to do that? Um, do I, how do I go about running Apache Flink? So it's a cluster or software that is state to be maintained. How do I do this? Uh, what do I do if my nodes fail over? How do I ensure high availability? Um, how do I gain insight into my job? So how do I find out if, uh, if there's a latency building up and my pipelines maybe cannot keep up with their event consumers um, and I'm just falling behind. So how do I go about all operating and running all those kinds of things? And this is where, um, Decodable comes into the picture because, well, as I mentioned, it's a managed stream processing platform based on Flink. So it takes care of all that for you. And also it uses SQL as the primary interface. And with that, I would like to hand over to Sharon and she can, or she will show us um, how this works in action. And for that, I need to make her a host. So let me just quickly do this. Um, make host, change host. There you go. Great, now I'm the host. Um, that was a great introduction, Luna. I wish I can do the same. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. Um, by the way, whatever you said uh, just now about how do I operate Flink, how do I handle the node failures? That's exactly what we do here. <laughs> That's good. I, I mean, I didn't mean to put you on the spot with it. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay, so um, yes, I'll talk about demo. So um, before that, I just want to show uh, the demo setup. So uh, put everyone in the same context here. So what I'm going to do is um, I have two database sources, MySQL and Postgres. I have three separate tables. I have product table, waters in MySQL and users in Postgres. Uh, for the first scenario, I'm gonna show you how to join those tables in the code board. Um, obviously you can't just join tables like if they are in two separate uh, databases. Um, the way we do it is to get the data into the code board, uh, into a stream and using CDC, what Luna just talked about and join them uh, using uh, link stream processing. And at the same side, we will get this enriched order. So what we're gonna do is enrich the order with product information and user information and get the enriched order information as a result into Elasticsearch. So let me jump into the demo. So uh, I just show you, I have the same thing. Like I have the two tables in my table and uh, Postgres and the user's table here. So um, in the code, 
sorry, now I need to go to this tab. So this is the decode for NAND. And this is the use uh, the web UI we have. The connections here uh, is focused on the top ones that are prefixed by Sharon. So the three tables I mentioned about uh, MySQL products, MySQL waters, and the PG users. So uh, before this, I already started them to um, reduce the setup time. Let's take waters, for example. The way you configure a football connection is uh, what you would expect to specify where your uh, MySQL database is. And here I'm connecting to the Sharon database uh, waters table. And for the connection, I also have a schema that matches the original schema that's defined on the uh, on the table. So let's see if I do describe orders. So side by side, uh, you should see the same thing, like all the fields, uh, the primary key, and all the other information here that should match. So this data gets into our system, into a stream. So we can follow this uh, top navigation bars to see the dependency chain. So here, I already have some uh, records here. And what you should see here should match if I do a select star from here. Um, note that, right, I have four orders and I have four here. Um, Note that this is just a sample of a preview. So uh, now the reader's uh, size is more that's why you see everything. Uh, if you have a lot of change events, you have a lot of records. Uh, for performance reasons, we will not show all of them. We'll show the most recent ones. But you get uh, a sense that this, uh, this is a preview of the stream. While you're working on connecting your data, this gives you the, uh, the uh, quick feedback. and confidence that your data is inside the system as correct. And under the hood, um, we are using CDC. So the table view shows you the uh, kind of the mature, uh, materialized view. But in fact, the raw data is in uh, Debezium format. That's uh, exactly what uh, Luna showed earlier, right? So we have the primary key, we have the before field, we have after. And uh, this is uh, what we use underneath. Uh, so the other, I will not show you other connections because they are basically the same. So let's focus on the pipeline. So this is how you can actually join the, uh, the tables together. So now we have like the three streams that are already inside the football system. We can just write a SQL to join them. Again, this just makes you feel super familiar. This is standard SQL, and the join is uh, as expected, and join the orders with product on um, product ID, and then join the users with users ID. So, and I'm outputting uh, a bunch of the fields here. So if I do a, a preview, I should see, uh, you know, the results, obviously this is running. So I'll show you later that this is outputting to uh, another stream. The preview is a feature where like, imagine you're still working on creating this pipeline. You should be able to see um, the, can you want to get a faster feedback um, of like whether your SQL is doing the right thing. So again, you can see, uh, right? This gives you the results and now we have the, username and zip code from users table and product name from the product table in this. So if now I make a change in my original orders table, right? I should see a change that here. So I should be able to see the change here, right? The order ID too, I just updated to be delivered and it gets updated here. And if we see the changes, we'll see that there's a record that's changing the water status from um, the, uh, from the, what's that before? Shift to deliver. It should be here. It was shift and now it's delivered. And I should see the same thing in the output stream. 
Yeah, so this one is here. Um, again, this pipeline as output is in this, this stream, in which order stream and the stream is consumed by this connection that is uh, Elasticsearch. So um, in Elasticsearch, we are hooked up with this index. So if I do, yeah, I already have here. So if I do a search on the index, okay, this might be even clearer. This is a query I run earlier. The order ID was uh, for two is shipped because I already updated again uh, in my, my table that I updated, sorry, ID two was delivered. So now I could see this one to become deliver. Yeah, there you go. And timestamp also updated. So that's how uh, I hope this is clear. Um, let's get back to this uh, demo scenario. Once I make a change on the original table in my SQL DB, uh, all the way that gets all the way propagated to uh, all the operators inside the codable. And you can see the updated results in the destination uh, here, Elasticsearch. Immediately, that the result is changed. And this is true for um, other tables too. So for example, if I update um, products, right? And changing the name. So let's do, see what the name is currently. So the ID one currently the name is Catboy. So I'm gonna make it, you know, the world based Catboy. So that, yeah, that's changed. Okay, cool. So that should also get all the way propagated to the products and. If we follow this, we should see this is world-based category. Um, and I'll skip a bunch of the intermediate steps. Let's see here, currently this is category. Now it's world-based category. So that's how you see the results in real time. Cool, so that's uh, again the first scenario. The second, I'll move to the second scenario. I'll use the same setup of the uh, table, tables and Elasticsearch. But here I want to focus on a different scenario. It's kind of similar to what uh, Guna mentioned earlier about creating audit logs. So what I showed you earlier is uh, we are working on you know, the, the logical schema of those tables, which matches their original tables, table schema. But Remember that I showed you the data coming as CDC. So we actually have more information than just the current view of the, um, of the schema, original logical schema. So we call this uh, Debezian format. In decodable uh, domain, we call it the physical schema. So the physical schema contains, you know, field like a before field, after field, the uh, OP, which means the operation field and some of the other metadata. So in this case, we can use those fields to create audit logs. Like for example, I'm gonna detect location change. And again, that should get all the way materialized uh, in Elasticsearch. So, so let's look at uh, the Postgres table, the users table. So let's uh, users. Oh. So we have like three users here, and uh, we use zip code to indicate where uh, the user is. And you can imagine like a real, real use cases, like if someone changes zip code, we want to update our recommendation to be more local to the user, right? So we want to have that change log. So here, again, this is a Postgres connection that's connecting to the user's table. Uh, nothing should be surprising. And this is the logical schema that gets ingested into our uh, stream. And now the second pipeline that's doing the detect user location change. This is the one we are focusing on for this scenario. So look at the staple. 
the as I mentioned, um, normally the change streams are operating on the logical schema. So, but in this case, we want to operate on the physical schema because we want to access to the field uh, of like the before field, after field. So in this case, uh, in we introduce a table function to allow you to indicate to the system that now we are operating under a different context. Right, so for this PG user stream, we use two append because essentially we are now not using processing it as a change stream. We are processing it as append logs or append stream. So uh, this is the indicator to how we want to process this stream. And now with this, I'm able to operate both, uh, on the fields that uh, are used uh, from the, uh, the physical schema. And what I'm doing here is, you know, I'm just taking all the operations that are update operation and the before zip code is different from after zip, zip code. Again, I can show you a preview of like what's what happens there. So this should be very soon. So I already made a change earlier before this, uh, this, uh, this session, but if I make another change, Right. Who's this e summer guy? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Some dude uh, probably also working for Decodable. <laughs> okay, so now I'm changing the second one. I'm changing Sharon's zip code. Right. That should get look. So now I also have Sharon's uh, change with the old zip code and new zip code. Uh, note that this is also interesting because we also get the uh, update time that from the DBZM envelope where it indicates the, uh, the original processing time of this update. Um, the risk should be straightforward. I'll just show you to complete the story. You would see this is again the same as what I already showed you. The output is into a different uh -huh. stream. This is the user location change events and see it gets ingested into uh, Elasticsearch, which is in a different index. And now I can also, um, sorry, query this one here. Awesome, so yeah, so here is, um, how you see uh, the result in Elasticsearch. Everything is there, all the changes are captured. Life is good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Wait, can can I add one, one comment on the, on the, why I'm so excited about this use case? Because very often, and I saw this in the Debezium community again and again, so people have their table specific change streams and let's say you think about your data in terms of domain-driven design. What happens is your aggregates, they're typically uh, persisted in multiple tables, right? So just to come back to the classical example, you have purchase orders. Then you would have one table with purchase order headers and another table with your order lines and your entire purchase order aggregate. That's like a one-to-end relationship um, between those two tables. And now from CDC, you would get those two table streams. And if you would like to do full text search on purchase orders and also all the attributes of your order lines, what you would want to do is you would want to put the entire aggregate structure into a single document in, in within your Elasticsearch index, right? So you, then you can search on a single index on purchase orders by attributes from the order headers and attributes from the order lines. And this is a, a super common requirement and being able to address this with uh, just a few lines of SQL, I think that's uh, really super powerful. Yeah, thanks for the addition of the real use case. I'm super excited. All right, so let's just wrap up and open up for questions. So obviously we uh, we are able to build this uh, fairly quickly because we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We leverage a lot on the open source communities like the DZ and Flink, and specifically in this case, Flink CDC. Thank you for all the contributors. Uh, this is amazing. Um, just to wrap up of what we presented, uh, a quick summary, CDC allows data to be independently processed and this is a good, architecture, at least we believe so, to create um, 
you know, scalable and flexible architecture. Data is super important and you don't want to, um, you know, there are so many ways to use them. You want to be able to process them independently. Second, Apache Flink natively supports uh, processing CDC events. So that's what I show you. They were able to understand the changes um, and process over the logical schema. Uh, lastly, the code will obviously leverage uh, Flink and all those uh, uh, open source uh, tools to and offer uh, change stream processing as a service. That's what I show you. So you don't need to manage all the infrastructure. You don't need to figure out how to deploy Flink and how to scale up and down, how to handle node failures, how to uh, migrate your workloads. So that's all for our uh, presentation and demo, uh, follow up on Twitter. Any questions, feel free to send us email. You can also sign up for free trial on our uh, op uh, corporate website. And let's... Uh, there's there's a few questions. Oh, okay. We, we yeah, can, so let's speak. jump into the questions. Right. So uh, let me take this one first from my good friends, Hans Peter. I'm really happy that you are here. That's, that's a great honor. So to, I, I will read it out. You said you mentioned multiple times that you are joining streams, but I do assume that you're actually doing joins on table semantics derived from the CDC events, right? So technically it's not a stream to stream join, which is happening here, is it? Um, so Sharon, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but uh, so I would say, yes, Hans Peter, you're right. It's, I mean, it depends on the terminology you use. So if you think about it in Kafka streams terms, yes, it's, it's, a, it's like a K table to K table join. In decodable terminology, we think about everything as a stream and there's two kinds of streams. And here it would essentially be a, a join of two change streams, which are like K tables. And Sharon, tell me please where I'm wrong. That's that's right. Yeah, I think essentially it's uh, it's just like uh, a different terminology. Uh, we believe it's more of a stream. Like we we would call it change stream joins because we are operating on streams. We're like I think naturally people feel um, are more familiar with table. I think um, you know from the product perspective, um, tables uh, just feel uh, very. Uh, variable that's what people do whereas the streams is something you are like uh flink stream processing engine is operating on so that's uh that's why we choose to use uh the, the terminology stream and we specifically use uh change stream to uh differentiate it from the you know append block so we call that append stream cool then there's one from constantinos um hi constantinos uh, so, uh, Sharon, this was, we had the softball question, so now the tough one comes, okay? Are you ready? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. So it says, how effective can the join run with millions of records and based on a time window? Yeah, so definitely those, um, the join, well, underneath we use Flink, so it's the same as uh, Flink, um, whatever Flink provides, uh, it's the same as how Flink scales. Uh, under the hood, uh, if you are running a join with, uh, you know, very high throughput records and over, you know, a time window and depending on the size of the time window, more resource is needed, definitely. Um, and there's probably a limit. Uh, so what we actually offer in the code boy is we would uh, provide provision more resource for more complex, uh, complicated pipelines. So if you, your state boy is using a join and, um, with the time windows, and we will give that uh, worker a lot more resource than just like uh, what you do with, with the simple filtering. Um, also, uh, we would dynamically uh, allocate more resource if we see the, uh, the the worker is running out of resource or like it's not catching up. There's a, a little bit of a manual step now, but we are working towards to make it completely automatic. So um, you can essentially like if something is running out of resource, we see like a big lag. Ideally, we would want to just like allocate more resource for that. There's probably a limit because then that uh, that will increase the cost. Uh, so the users will like uh, will need to give us a map of how much they want to scale up. 
And if the, the load is really too big, then sorry, we can't handle that. Uh, does that answer your question? We, we take silence as agreement and oh. as she has no way <laughs> I don't think we can actually one. say it. <laughs> okay. But uh, you can follow up with a uh, with another question if it doesn't help, okay? Yeah, or uh, Slack in the exactly, uh, exactly community right. Slack. Okay. Is the demo available for exploration? Can we run locally? Uh, well, we, I assume you mean run locally means you set up a decodable stack locally, which is not what we offer because we offer it as a service. Uh, however, if you signed up for our free trial account, then you can run the demo end to end yourself, I believe. Uh, I think there's a limit of how many jobs you can run uh, for the free trial, but you should be able to uh, run this um, locally, I think. If you hit uh, you know, size limit, like uh, the, the credit limit, you can also talk to us, we can set up um, a separate demo for you. Um, yeah. So in short, uh, use Decoble account, uh, sign up for Decoble accounts to run the demo. Uh, we, we don't provide a way to, for users to set up like the whole Decoble stack locally. Okay, another question. How does Flink deal with the streams that come in out of water? Would that complicate joint CD system from different database? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, so Flink deal with the uh, streams out of water uh, with um, basically, if you are doing a window join where the water is important, uh, it's using the uh, what's that, the watermark strategy. So users would specify, you know, what's the uh, what's the what's the max uh, delay you want to allow for event time and um, and some kind of like a quick period um, for uh, the the window to wait. So that's typically how it works. Um, and I think that's what you mean for events coming out of water. For CDC specifically, um, this is insert. Well, there's kind of a little bit of end to end consistency you have to guarantee, which is why we have the primary key. So um, the, the original source event will have the the transaction logs will be consumed in order into decodable. And internally, we have much more. We will, re, uh, we will partition um, the, the streams into different partitions just for performance purpose. So with, with the primary key you specified, for each key, the order is guaranteed. So that's why that's also propagated end to end through the system. So that's how the order is guaranteed for CDC stream. All right. So I think that's it in terms of questions. Um, yeah. Will we publish the demo tutorial as a blog? Yeah, that's an interesting question um, from our colleague, John. Yeah, I guess we should do a blog about the demo. That's a good idea. And can you go to the next slide? Um, oh, yeah. Right, there's a call to action, John, you want to speak to that, right? I, I, I do. There's actually one question that um, that's still out there from my friend Robert Zyke. Uh, and I wonder uh, if Robert's still on the call. Uh... Do I, am I able to make someone talk for you there? I think, I think, uh, I think Robert's left. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but he can. I mean, we are we know on Twitter, so he can follow up uh, on Twitter if he wants to. Yeah. So um, HP has another question for you, Gunnar. Ah, uh, okay. I see. In relation to oh yeah, in relation to this last question, how do you deal with? Oh, now that's really getting. Thank you, Hans Peter. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> in relation to this last question, how do you deal with windowed stateful computations and late arriving records? Is there a concept of grace periods, 
Also, can you influence when records are emitted? Is this only happening when windows are closed? I mean, that's even more than one question, HP. <laughs> <laughs> but so okay. late arrival records, I guess, uh, Sharon, you, you can talk to that, right? Yeah, so I I think there, um, I, I am worried that I'm speaking like with assumption of some flink knowledge that people may have. Uh, so let's see. Uh, do you deal using how do you deal with Windows Group operations and late arriving record? Uh, is there there is well, I think the grid series is uh maybe a little bit overloaded. Whatever you well while you specify the Windows strategy, you would specify um a time um, of like when you can, it's basically a strategy of telling things when you can close the window, when you can advance to the next window, right? So there is a time period you can say, uh, well, as I'm seeing even time step uh, five, um, I will not close window by uh, the, the watermark that the window that's from zero to five yet. I will wait until I see a even time step of 10 then I will close the event, uh, the window from one to uh, from zero to five. So that's what the grid period I meant. Basically, it's a strategy to tell think uh, how what's the the maximum uh, the what's the event time step I I um, I can uh, I'll receive before I can close uh, a window that's earlier to the to that time step. So if you specify you know that as a zero, then you close it immediately when you see a time step of five. But if you specify that as a five, then you will close like window zero to five until you get the time step of 10. So hopefully that's more clear. Um, can you influence when records are emitted? Uh, Maybe can I can I say something on that one? Um, yeah. There is one specific thing which we have in mind there in, when in particular when it comes to CTC streams from Debezium. And this is essentially basing windowed operations on transaction boundaries uh, as they are done in the source database. So um, sticking to our purchase order example, typically you would like to materialize this join between the purchase order and the order lines table only once you, re once you have received all the events which are originating from one transaction because you don't want to materialize such a join and only produce like a half complete um, aggregate join, right? Um, and that's definitely one of, because the Bezium, um gives us these information. So we know about transaction boundaries, we can know um, in, within a given transaction, how many events there will be for each particular CDC stream. So we can use this information and, you know, apply manual windowing control to emit uh, such an aggregate only once the transaction has complete. I'm not sure whether this answers fully this question, but definitely that's something which we want to explore. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think itself, the transaction boundary itself is going to be like a big um, topic that I, I have to admit, uh, I don't think there there's a lot of semantics and uh, as standards we need to define. I don't think there is a well-defined, like assume we are literally drawing tables from, um, or like we are drawing the the, uh, the streams originally from different tables in different databases, even though they all have a transaction, then like there's also like some coordination uh, that are hard to coordinate. Um, but yeah. All those, uh, all those joints should operate on committed uh, transactions. So that's uh, that's what we currently guarantee. Exactly. Um, there's another question which we answered in the written chat, but I wanted to read it out because I think it's interesting to everybody. So Robin Fair is asking, is there a difference between Flink SQL, so what you get with the upstream Apache Flink project and the SQL within Decodable? And the answer is, Yes and no, or no and yes. So the uh, uh, syntax itself, it's 100% Flink SQL, but then there's a few custom or additional functions which are useful for specific purposes, which are added in on top of what you would get with um, 
uh, Apache Flink, uh, which are part of uh, Decodable. So I hope yeah. So for example, the one I just showed, uh, the to append function, it's uh, it's our uh, addition additional function, additional table function that's not part of the Flink table. Right. Oh, and HP says uh, thanks for answering. Really appreciate. It. Yeah. I mean, thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. <clears throat> So I think that's it in terms of questions. Um, so I would say thank you to everybody for being here. It was really a pleasure. And I believe, John, you want to read out a few uh, um, like upcoming events and, and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah thanks, good and Sharon. And, and thank you again for a very compelling talk and demonstration. And yes, I will be trying to capture Sharon's demo and put that out in a kind of blog tutorial so that you can try it with the free account as they they said and a lot of a lot of the demo you've already seen and you could probably reproduce yourselves if you have the right uh, kind of sources and sinks um but yeah uh, sharon would you mind sharing your screen again oh sorry that's all right uh... so just just in, in closing uh, you know if you want to find out a little bit more um interact with us uh there are various ways that you can do that So I heard we on Twitter, on so YouTube, this right? One, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, so you know, on on, on Twitter, uh, you see Gunnar and Sharon are there. Uh, Decodable, generally, we are at Decodable Co. Um, and you can come visit us at the, yep, there you go. So uh, uh, you can see Sharon and Gunnar there and, and us. Um, but then if you want to come visit us on the web, in case you think we are like an IO or .com, no, we're actually decodable.co. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about what we do, uh, links to videos and resources, um, and also sign up for the newsletter if you'd like to get a kind of regular feed from the, of, of, of these things. But you know, the main thing that folks want to do is to is to start for free. It is free, uh, no catch, no credit card required. So appdecodable.co, um, and you can kind of play around and, and, and see exactly what you can do with Decodable. Um, we have a very good doc site. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where videos like this and a lot more demos exist. Um, if you want to kind of talk to Gunnar and Sharon, you can do that in the community Slack channel. The rest of the team is hanging out there as well. Uh, very soon we have a forum site coming as well, so watch for that. And my my cliche here is all you can call Saul. So Saul is our very friendly representative. If you want to have a chat, set up a demo for your company, he'll be more than happy to uh, to help help work it out. Uh, yes, it's an email, uh, Marika. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> but I like saying call Saul or call Marika, who works with Saul as well. Uh, and with that, so we'll be back again, I think, in two weeks' time, where I believe Hubert will be talking about security. So uh, watch out for that. It'll be on the ticker on our website, and we'll be promoting that in our Twitter channel. So with that, again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you everyone for turning up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye bye. See you now. soon. Thank you, everyone.